Hi, I'm David Gregg. In this week's video, I'm accompanying geologist Brian Oakley as he measures beach profiles at Napa Tree Point, a barrier beach which sticks off the lower left corner of Westerly, Rhode Island. Did you know geologists study beaches? Well, of course they do. They're sedimentologists and coastal geomorphologists and after all, what is sand but really tiny stones? As Brian will explain, he's been measuring beach profiles at five points along the Napa Tree Spit since uh, 2012, shortly before Hurricane Sandy struck Rhode Island. And that's allowed him to reconstruct the changing shape of the Napa Tree Spit and the dunes that are on it. And he's been able to correlate changes in shape with natural events and storms and seasons. So a big thank you to Brian and to Janice Sassy with the Watch Hill Conservancy, who helped us get around Napa Tree Point on a sunny but very windy December day. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. So, uh, I'm Brian Oakley from Eastern Connecticut State University and a board member of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And we're down here at Watch Hill Harbor, headed out onto Napa Tree Point to do some beach profiles, where we measure uh, the profile all the way across the barrier of Napa Tree from Little Narragansett Bay all the way to Block Island Sound, tracking how it changes over time. Uh, we do this four times a year as well as after big storms, and it allows us to see what happens to the barrier during storms but also what happens when it's recovering after the storms. So this benchmark we put in when we started the project in 2013, and this is essentially the, the tie point for the whole profile. This is kind of zero, zero. And the idea is these are four foot sectional uh, stainless steel rod. They go down 28 feet. So if the whole barrier, when the whole barrier is overwashed, uh, these should theoretically still be in the same spot to keep everything consistent over time.
So this, this work that we're doing out here has been supported by the Watch Hill Conservancy and the Watch Hill Fire District since we started. Um, I serve uh, in full discretion as a, as a science advisor for Napa Tree and um, they're a very proactive agency in, or conservancy in terms of using the best science to manage this wonderful resource down here. Um, Janice Sassy, who's the manager, likes to say her job is to keep Napa Tree from being loved to death. And that's often what we're trying to do is balance the people with the conservation because you can see what kind of habitat it is down here for um, a whole bunch of different critters and plants. So uh, we try to preserve it as best we can, but still recognize that everybody wants to come here and go to the beach. How long have you been doing these transects? Or has someone, how long has somebody been doing these transects? We started them in July of 2013. Um, we kind of, when I started, I viewed Napa Tree as the forgotten child of the South Shore. It's kind of around the corner from Watch Hill, so there were no active profiles and really not a lot of studies on the shoreline change in geology in Napa Tree had been done. So we saw it as, as an opportunity to get in and start a, start a project from the ground up. And how accurate is the uh, device that you're using to measure? So this is called RTK, or Real-Time Kinematic GPS. So it's got a GPS antenna, and then in that green bag is actually a little wireless hotspot called the MiFi. And what the MiFi is doing is acting um, basically like a cell phone, and it's talking to a base station. And when we're down here at Napa Tree, it's talking to either Groton or Charlestown, Rhode Island, depending on, on the signal that day. And what that connection is doing is applying all of the needed atmosphere corrections to the GPS signal in real time. That makes it accurate to about an inch in all directions. That means elevation as well as uh, X and Y, or latitude and longitude. So it allows us to get uh, pretty precise with, with measuring these changes out here. And when you get back to your office, how do you turn it into uh, a cross-section diagram map or whatever? So we take the data out of the GPS with something called a shape file. It's a, a GIS file, a geographic information system file. And in that it's got the latitude, or actually we use northing and easting, but the X and the Y, as well as the elevation. Uh, and then from there we run a calculation in the software that measures the distance from our starting stakes, our survey stakes, and that tells us the horizontal distance from, from the stake. So then we can plot it as basically a cross section, as a, as a distance and an elevation. Uh, elevation comes in relative to what's called the North American vertical datum of 1988. So we run uh, an additional calculation to correct that to mean lower low water, to relate it back to uh, the elevation of the average of the lower low tide on any given day. What do you detect after m many years of measuring these cross sections? So what we've detected is actually movement, but not what you might expect because we haven't had a major storm. 2013 post-date Sandy. Um, so is Napa tree moving? Yes. In the big picture, it absolutely is moving and it's moving north, it's migrating. Uh, it does that during big storms when they, the barrier overwashes. Uh, basically, we call it rollover. During that uh, process, sediment from the front of the barrier is picked up, brought over the dunes, put on the back barrier, and the whole landform shifts landward but also builds upward over time. Uh, because we haven't had a storm big enough to do that in our record, we've actually been measuring and studying the recovery since Sandy. Uh, the active part of the beach recovers within weeks from a storm like that, actually probably within two weeks, usually within one full tidal cycle. But the dunes, uh, that takes years to develop. And it was about a five-year process to get Napa Tree back to kind of its pre-storm volume when you look at, at the dunes and the whole picture of the barrier. So where does this sand come from? So during storms, it goes offshore, and then it, it takes time to come back on. Once it's on the beach, it takes uh, time to get into the dunes. Uh, the vegetation has to get reestablished. Vegetation helps to trap the windblown sand and help the dune accrete vertically. Um, and we can't see that so much here, but on the front of the, the dunes, you can actually see where the vegetation is still pretty sparse. Uh, that's the what we call the incipient foredune, and most of that dune and dune grass is within the last couple of years. Uh, we really noticed that coming back kind of five years after Sandy, so 2017, and then the last few years since then, we've seen that continued recovery. So the sand sits out there, it's stored on the shore face, and then works its way back on on, on that cycle of years. Napa tree is kind of isolated in terms of sand. It's probably not getting very much, if any, from 
around the corner in the, on the Watch Hill East Beach side, and it doesn't seem like it's getting any from Little Narragansett Bay. Um, that's Sandy Point that's migrating towards Stonington, uh, where they have to dredge it every few years to keep the channel open. Natural History Survey videos are made possible through the generous contributions of members and friends. Want to help us do more environmental science and conservation? Hit the like button, share our videos with your circle, subscribe, or make a financial contribution on our website, ranhs.org, or through Patreon. Thanks, and see you out there.